narrow-minded Christian. His story was written in a language you do not understand in a book without your recent shortcuts to God. Who would die for a lie that was known to be a lie about a failed Messiah who was already dead if he was dead? Christians continue to speak of sacrifices. Some Jews point to David and to Isaiah as proof that the sacrificial system was not necessary. Why don't Jews believe in Jesus? <laughs> well, let me just say, first off, I'm Jewish and I believe in Jesus. So I guess we could say that uh, that's not exactly a true statement and I'm not the only one. There's lots and lots of Jewish people who believe in Jesus, hundreds and hundreds of thousands actually. But I guess we need to question the obvious because we know that there's an awful lot of Jewish people who don't believe in Jesus. The answer comes down to without. You see, it is my belief that without a miracle of faith, without a miracle of grace, and without a miracle of conviction, neither I nor anyone else would believe in Jesus in the manner commanded in the New Testament. You see, without God, saving faith, as is understood by Christians, is nothing more than a fleeting wish for a hopeless sinner. Perhaps because I believe I'm not well equipped to properly understand someone else's skepticism about that which I believe. For me, the scriptures provide sufficient proof to believe, but this is not true universally. The argument goes like this, fact, without shedding of blood is no remission of sins. Conclusion, it is therefore obvious that the shed blood of Jesus is our provision for the remission of sins. And that settles the debate if no one disputes the obvious truth. Without Jesus, there is no forgiveness. Now, it works for me, but it doesn't work for everyone. It is perfectly resolved for a Christian who believes Jesus is the perfect sacrifice prepared by God as the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world to take away the sins of the world. That concept certainly preaches and it is more certainly true, but millions still reject that logic, Jews and non-Jews. It is only obvious to the recipient of the above mentioned miracles to those without the miracle, it might be a lame philosophical argument. Without a sacrifice, there is no forgiveness. Jesus is our sacrifice. There is nothing left to talk about. Yet, to some Jewish people and to some non-Jewish people, it is not enough to give up everything dearly held about Judaism or whatever their one's religion might be. In fact, there is a plausible response. Blind, lame, arrogant, narrow-minded Christian, you speak of our King David, but you do not know his words. How dare you? Tell me about the God I love. This is the God of my father and my forefathers. The God of Israel has been loved by my people since he delivered us from slavery in Egypt. His story was written in a language you do not understand in a book without your recent shortcuts to God. Ouch. Christian, you show nothing more than a late to the party, shallow expression of faith. Before you tell me about your faith, show me your deeds of mercy and explain how you stood silent while we perished in every generation, often at the hands of Christians. I ask, is your argument strong enough 
to convince me to give up my heritage that has carried my people for thousands of years. If the best you can offer is a declaration that I need a sacrifice and you suggest that Jesus is the sacrifice that I need, how then do you answer our ancient King David that you love so much through feigned, strained, flawed interpretations? David said, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. You can read that in Psalms chapter 40, verse 6. Christian, you need a sacrifice. King David disagreed. Is this a conflict? No. David completed his revelation. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I believe David spoke of our Messiah. Far better than a burnt offering, Jesus delighted in the will of God. The law was truly written on his heart. In spite of the fact that our Messiah is pure, Innumerable evils have compassed the one spoken of by David. I believe those were my evil actions hanging on Jesus like a plague. According to David, Jesus made them his own, saying, Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me. God wants a sacrifice, but he also wants something more than a sacrifice. He wants the true praise. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. He wants faithful obedience and a vibrant sacrifice of praise. Yet all of us have been disobedient and none of us are perfect. All have sinned except one, the one who came in the volume of the book. It remains true that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. King David's words also remain true for Thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. Is this a conflict? No. David went on to explain in the following verse that my people might have misunderstood the entire concept of sacrifice. Maybe Christians miss it too. What is a proper sacrifice for a Jew or a Christian to bring to God? The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Now, what brings our brokenness? Why should our heart be contrite? God is holy. We are sinners. If we humble ourselves and come to God in faith, He will certainly accept us and forgive us. Christians continue to speak of sacrifices. Some Jews point to David and to Isaiah as proof that the sacrificial system was not necessary. I will quote, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams. And in fact, God said, bring no more vain oblations. My people like to focus on festivals, Sabbath days, prayer and fasting to obtain favor and forgiveness with God. Is it right to celebrate these times and the cyclical events prescribed in the same books that reveal our Messiah? 
I think so. Jews think so. Christians tend to ignore what we value in these celebrations. Yet, how do Jews answer the Hebrew prophet? He did not end arguing against the sacrifices. God also warned that these religious observances were an abomination to him. The new moons and Sabbaths, it is iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. We read in Isaiah chapter 1. Wow, I mean, it sounds like nothing matters. Jews and Christians are all just flat off the reservation. My point is that pat Christian answers won't convince an unbeliever, and pat Jewish responses do not clear an unbeliever. Perhaps it would be best to meditate on the words of the Hebrew prophet in their correct context. God explained what he demanded. He said, wash you, make you clean, and put away the evil of your doings. Relieve the oppressed. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I asked you to meditate on those words. If you are Jewish, you probably focus on tikkun olam, the repairing of the world. Good works, good deeds that will bring the Messiah and improve your heaven and earth. As a Jew, you likely reflect on the need for tzedakah, charity, to help the poor. A Jew reads Isaiah and realizes the urgent requirement to stand for the oppressed, the widow, the orphan, and the enslaved. A Christian likely sees the promise of pure white robes replacing the soiled garments ruined by our sinful lives. Do you ever wonder how a Jewish person can read the ancient Hebrew prophets and still deny the obvious about Jesus? These few short messages might not solve the problem of the ages. I do hope it causes my viewers and friends to question the obvious. I remain confident about what I previously stated. Fact, without shedding of blood is no remission of sins. Conclusion, it is therefore obvious that the shed blood of Jesus is our provision for the remission of sins. And that settles the debate if no one disputes the obvious. Truth, without Jesus, there is no forgiveness. Dilemma. This is sufficient for a Christian who believes the Bible. It is insufficient for a Jew who believes the Bible. And by the way, can you forgive the straw man? <sighs> it's easy to win an argument with a straw man. The writer presents the questions, deflects the difficult issues and wins the debate with flair and unfailing logic. But I'm just a Jewish guy sitting here with a cup of coffee like I was when I finished my morning Bible study. How serious should I be taken? I believe in Jesus. That's enough to disqualify me among my own people. And I have presented some arguments against believing in Jesus that some Jews have used against me. Well, in fact, some Jews will never accept Jesus. Some non-Jews will never accept Jesus, no matter how convincing the evidence. 
evidence. Jesus rose from the grave and countless early Jewish witnesses died as martyrs. They could have saved their lives by simply admitting the hoax, if it were a hoax. I mean, who would die for a lie that was known to be a lie about a failed Messiah who was already dead if he was dead? No reasonable person would die for a certain lie if given the opportunity to live as those who would have lived if they recanted their belief in the risen Jesus. Seems quite obvious, doesn't it? Question the obvious. You might want to go back and watch the first little piece that I did in this short little series. You see, without certain miracles, belief evades the most desperate sinner. And here is Randy's unwavering premise. The dilemma is rarely solved by arguing and not able to be eternally resolved without a miracle. Pray for my people. Look around. We need many miracles. Okay, cards are on the table. Any comments, suggestions? What do you think? Till next time, Shalom.